Hello, um, my name is Professor Mark Barry, a Professor of Practice in Connectivity at Cardiff University School of Geography and Planning. Um, I also uh, act as a strategic advisor to Transport for Wales. Some of you may know that over the last 10, 15 years, I've been quite involved in the development of metros in South East Wales and, and transport policy more broadly, um, also with Cardiff Council and the Cardiff Capital Region uh, and Welsh Government. But today, I want to try and spend a little bit of time talking about the issue of road building uh, and congestion and the ongoing debate, if there still is one, uh, related to the M4 in South Wales. And importantly, to, to think about the impact of induced demand. Um, there's some counterintuitive um, phenomena, I think more of us need to try and understand. And, and I came late to this. Um, others were, were berating me for my um, support of the M4 several years ago. Um, but I've, um, I've read and I've learned uh, and I now take a different view. So we all know congestion is a problem. We all know that many of our roads get very busy and it causes delays um, that contributes to uh, excess carbon emissions, poor air quality. It holds people up because of stress. Um, it seems to be a phenomenon that you know, has an easy solution. I think first we, we need to consider when you're stuck in traffic and there's four cars I drew earlier stuck in traffic. There are also um, people who, whilst you're in your traffic, have chosen either to take a different route or not travel at all. And actually, in reality, um, for every user on the road, there are probably many more actually either going a different way or actually choosing not to travel. And this is really important. So the obvious answer is to fix congestion um, for those four cars that were stuck in traffic earlier is to widen the road. And actually, day one, that often works. You find that the immediate impact of a new road is that it does actually ease congestion. But this doesn't last because, as I said, um, within a period of time, be it days, months, years even, Many of those people who were either uh, going a different route, taking a different road or not traveling now realize there's more road available for them and actually decide to actually use the road. So what does happen eventually, um, and it happens in nearly every case, and the data is very clear, that once you build the, the extra road space, it will fill up. You will get congestion back. You look at the US and the history of places like the KT Freeway in Houston, which has spent billions of dollars over decades continually widening all it does is generate more road traffic and this is true everywhere it will be true of the m4 as well you can't build your way out of congestion there's also another impact which is slightly longer term but actually is probably more damaging in the long term it's the reality that actually if you improve connectivity between places developers and i, I don't blame them build houses uh, and offices and especially retail that actually is designed around the connectivity you built, roads. And our planning systems enable this. So now in South Wales, we do have a huge amount of real estate, offices, especially retail, out of town retail, and homes that can only be accessed in a car. I mean, the retail phenomenon, I think, has done so much da damage to our high streets, especially in the valleys. Places like Trago Mills, Cavartha Retail Park, uh, MacArthur Glen. We have Sputty Park. We have Celtic Springs. We have Cardiff Gate. I could go on. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of square foot of retail and offices that are now locked in car use. When we have the, you know, the, the reality of all our volume house builders who just want to build masses of greenfield, low density housing, again, dependent upon the car, you can see we have a real problem. And of course, what that does, it just locks in more congestion. So it's not just a congestion from the induced demand from people changing a choice. It's all the extra demand we now get through the development that is only serviceable via car use. This is a very unvirtuous circle we have to try and break. And we have to ask a question, you know, what sort of future do we want? The reality is, and we know the data is very clear, um, build more roads, get more cars, get more congestion. It's called induced demand. There is a huge amount of evidence and data out there. Even the DFT recognizes. There's also a phenomenon now that we've actually had to design our cities around cars more when they're not moving, i.e. when they're parked, than when they are moving. Remember, um, cars spend probably 95% of their time doing absolutely nothing sat at the side of a road or in a car park, tying up precious natural resources, um, all the energy required to make them build them. 
for something that is so poorly utilised, it's I think it's scandalous that we can devote so much energy and natural resource to such a poorly utilised mode of transport. This is again a question, existential question we have to ask. And when people talk about the M4 and, and the congestion, you know, the, the data is very clear. Every major road in the UK at peak times is congested. It isn't just the M4. In fact, the M4 isn't the worst in the UK. You look at the M60 or the M25, you know, there's a problem that we've actually built and exacerbated through our planning system over decades. And this has a huge cost. Um, people talk about we pay our road tax. Well, no, you don't. The reality is car use has huge costs to society. I mentioned the carbon emissions and transport and transport sector has perhaps been the slowest to respond to our all obligations to reduce, to reduce um, carbon emissions. And car use is the biggest section uh, of the transport sector. And again, the slowest to respond to our obligations. When you add 160,000 road traffic accidents in the UK every year, 23,000 serious injuries required in major hospital interventions, 1,700 fatalities. So on average, five people a day are killed in a road traffic accident in the UK, one cyclist. This costs, from the DFT's own figures, £16 billion a year. When you add you know, premature deaths from poor air quality, maybe 20 to 30,000 people a year, low density sprawl, locking in more car dependency, then the wear and tear on the roads of all those extra cars, and yes, the never ending congestion affecting everyone's quality of life. This is madness. The, the cost to us all as taxpayers to support this carnage and this poor health impacts and the carbon emissions is astronomical, billions and billions of pounds a year. Is there something else we could do? Is there a better way? Well, and surprisingly, there is. So we, we have a question. How do we deal with congestion and our out of town developments? Do we do what seems easy and intuitive, but is actually not actually, by widening the roads and creating more road space that will just fill up with more cars? They will. Uh, people tell me, no, Mark, this isn't true. It is true. I came late to this. You cannot build your way out of congestion. Or do we do something else? Do we actually do what we know works? And I've just come back from Europe. The, the level of public transport, capacity, integration, ease of use is a, it's an eye watering example of what's possible. You know, if our new tram trains for the South Wales Metro, each one could hold nearly 500 people. A bus can handle 70 to 150 people. That takes hundreds and hundreds of cars off the road. It should be a no-brainer, frankly, but it comes with a cost. We also have to start building more sensibly. I know we've got a history now of 40 years of low density sprawl, but we have to stop doing that. The LDPs and our strategic development plans have to be changed and the remits given to local authorities and the regions to build more densely around our transport networks, not on greenfield sprawled sites that can only be accessed in a car. You can't claim your development is carbon friendly and sustainable if you have to get in your car every time you want to buy a pint of milk. And this is true for so many of our developments. If you densify, and that picture there, some, someone I took, someone I took in Malaga a few years ago, more of the things you need to do are closer. More of the things you need to do can be done without getting in a car. It just takes time. We have to change how we plan and how we develop. We also have to recognise that many, many short trips in our cities that are currently car-based can be converted to active travel. I'm not saying everyone needs to get out of their car all the time, but I absolutely know that a significant portion of those car trips in cities, most of which are less than two miles, could be converted to walking or cycling. Part of this is a cultural issue, but it can be done and needs to be done. The health benefits and reduction in long-term costs for our health services is very, very material. We have to consider that. So there we go, more public transport capacity, densify, densifying our developments around transit, more active travel, but all of that's gonna cost money. Well, the, the pinch here, the kind of kick in the tail, is that we have to start pricing the road. It's not fairly paid for. We all subsidize car use through our taxes. As I mentioned, the road traffic accidents, the air quality, the carbon emissions, the sprawl. If we could properly apportion the price, that funding can be used to fund the operational cost of the additional capacity we need for public transport, but also to help fund the capital programs that are necessary. Now, I'm not saying this is easy or this is something that we can do overnight, but we have to turn this super tank around. We spend 50 years becoming addicted to the car. 
I go so far to say the car has become our heroine and we have to decouple ourselves from that terribly damaging addiction. It means some tough choices. And I don't think, I'm sure, in fact, I know, in fact, we're not really in a place politically where we've made those tough choices. We're talking about our net zero obligations. But in terms of the capital funded and tough decisions required to actually make those real, we're getting closer, but we haven't done that. And everyone needs to understand car use is actually a problem and we have to reduce it. And that means doing some radical things on public transport, on planning, on things like active travel, but especially on road pricing.